This morning, our scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. We'll begin reading in the 7th verse. I invite those who are able to please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Jesus is speaking and he says, Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from from plowing or tending sheep in the field, Come here at once and take your place at the table. Would you not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. As we have heard the word of God, let us now affirm our faith in God in the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Today we are finishing the first sermon series in our year of focusing on walking with Jesus. And this series has been built around the idea, the the call that we are supposed to be apprentices of Jesus Christ. That we should all be learning from the Master. Growing to be the disciple that Jesus knows that we can be. Putting our faith and our trust in Jesus And accepting his call to follow him. That, that should define who we are. Years ago, many years ago, in in the apprentice world, once you apprentice yourself to someone and you, you learn the trade for them, often, well, when last names came into play, that's where your last name came from. If you were, had apprenticed yourself to someone who made barrels and you finally, last names came around, you are now a cooper because you, came, you were a person who was a cooper. You made barrels or someone that worked in a mill, you were a miller. It, there, it just seems to flow that way. Being a disciple of Jesus, it might not change our last name, but it should be what defines us. Being an apprentice of Jesus should be what people know us as, how they see us, how they experience us. And so that's the call that we're trying to live into. Today, the passage we have before us, this this teaching from Jesus isn't one of the most popular or favorite passages where Jesus speaks. I'm going to go ahead and admit that. Probably none of you got up this morning saying, I've got to be in church today. He's talking about that passage where we call ourselves worthless slaves. I love that. No. But I think it's key. I think it's important. Not just because Jesus said it, which makes it important, but also what Jesus is saying makes it important. It it tells us that following Jesus, that being an apprentice of Jesus, being a servant of Jesus, 
isn't about power or prestige or attention or accolades. We're, we're, not a, we're not looking to get what we are owed. We are not seeking what we are entitled to. No. It's about serving and being a servant of Jesus. It's about serving without demanding all of that, that attention. We serve not to get the accolade. We serve to serve. You see, serving Jesus isn't about winning. And it isn't about being better than anyone else. Rabbi Harold Kushner used to tell a story about this bright young man who was a med student, a pre-med student at Stanford, and, and he truly was excelling in his academic career. He was brilliant. And his family, his parents, to reward him one summer, decided they, they wanted to send him somewhere so he could get away from things, but also broaden his mind and his experiences. And so they sent him to Asia for the summer. And while there, broadening his experiences, he met a guru who shared some information with him. He said, don't you see how you're poisoning your soul with all this success-oriented way of living? Your idea of happiness is to stay up all night studying for an exam just so you can get a better grade than your best friend in the class. Your idea of a good marriage isn't finding the woman who will be your best friend and will, will make you whole. It's to win the girl that everybody else wants. Just to show you can. That's not how people are supposed to live. Give it up. Come and, and join us here. In, and join us in this atmosphere where we all share and, and where we all love one another. The young man, it, it, he was overwhelmed by that idea, and, and, and that really did seem appealing. And, and so he called his parents and told them he would not be coming home. Dropped out of school and, and moved into this ashram, this, this spiritual retreat, where everything was equal and no one worried about who was the best. But six months later, his parents got a letter from him. And he wrote to them and said, Dear Mom and Dad, I know you weren't happy with the decision that I made last summer, but I want to tell you how happy that decision has made me. For the first time in my life, I'm at peace. Here, there's no competing. There's no hustling. There's no trying to get ahead of anyone else. Here, we are all equal. Here, we all share. This way of life is so much in harmony with the inner essence of my soul that in only six months, I had become the number two disciple in the ashram. <laughs> and if I work hard, and if I can just get the edge, I know that I can be the number one disciple by June. I mean, you can take him out of, out of Stanford, but you can't take the drive out of it. There's something in the human condition that makes us strive to be number one. And, oh, well, if we're not number one, we at least want to be better than somebody else. It's like the old story about being chased by a bear. I don't have to be able to outrun a bear. I just have to be able to outrun you. That's the key. We just want to be able to beat someone if we can't be number one. None of that's part of following Jesus. Jesus tells this very simple story about a man who has come into his house after a hard day's work. And Jesus offers this funny suggestion asking if, if we, as the master of the house, would have ever said to our servants, sit down while we feed you. You've worked hard today. The crowd listening to Jesus would have found that funny. Now, many of them, very few of them probably would have had servants of their own. 
but many of them were probably poor and they were servants to others. No master is going to have the servants sit down and they serve them. He's going to expect to be taken care of and, and his needs met. And he's not going to gush over the wonderful service he receives. They aren't owed that. Jesus says that this connects to us. That the things we do to serve him, the way that we work to grow in our faith and, and to grow in our service, to change and, and to sacrifice, that when we do those things, it's, it's not about the praise we get. We should consider ourselves servants who are simply called to be obedient. We're doing what we ought to do. When we do what we are supposed to do in following Christ, we shouldn't spend a lot of time standing around patting ourselves on the back and hoping others will join in. We can't expect that if we do what we're supposed to do following Christ, that we stand a chance of being named Disciple of the Month. Because that's just not what it's about. Years ago in a church I served, I, I, I had the honor of serving alongside a wonderful children's minister who did phenomenal work. And one year at a dinner... Uh, she stood up and she wanted to thank people who had been a part of Vacation Bible School that year. She was, it had been a great Vacation Bible School. And, and she started off, she started off by saying, Now I know I'm going to forget some people, but I want to thank everyone who helped with Vacation Bible School. And she named this person, this person, this person, this person. She named six or eight people along the way. And then she closed out by saying, Now that's not everybody. I know I've forgotten some people. But I just want to say thank you. And she did forget me. And everybody she forgot didn't care that they weren't named at the dinner. Except one. Except one who, well, was so upset by the fact she wasn't named at the dinner. She assumed that, that she wasn't named at the dinner because we didn't really appreciate what she did. That's how she, but that's what she extrapolated from that. They didn't name me at the dinner, so what I did didn't matter. They didn't like the way that I did it. They didn't really care that it was done, and therefore I shall never serve at Vacation Bible School again, nor will I ever serve in any other area at the church again, but I'm not going to stop talking about it. And she spent the next year talking about it. I'd like to say that that idea of needing that kind of praise was isolated to that one event, but unfortunately I've seen that more than once. But we don't do what we do because of the praise. We do what we do because we're disciples. We're servants. It's what God calls us to do. It's the privilege that God gives us to do. We also, we're not doing it because we've, we've flipped over in the Bible toward those, those latter books in the New Testament. And we've noticed that somewhere in Revelation, it mentions the idea of jewels in a crown. That if you do wonderful things, that you earn jewels in your crown. That kind of thought process. And, and so we are doing what we're doing because we want a really blinged out crown. No, it's not why we do it. It's also not why we do it, because we remember the old gospel hymn that tells us that one day we're going to have a mansion just over the hilltop in heaven. And, and we want it to be ours to be like the one in the song that's a gold one that's silver lined. No, that's not why we do what we do. That's not the purpose. You see... Remember what Jesus says about how greatness looks in the kingdom of God. It doesn't come from the one who has the most. It doesn't come from the one who is praised more often. It doesn't come by the one who is being served 
But greatness is found in the one who is the servant of all. The serving. Now, does this mean we should never honor and give thanks to other people for what they do? No, not at all. We should celebrate others and we should be grateful for others because that is a kind and a gracious thing to do. It shows love. It shows compassion. It encourages. So it, it doesn't mean we don't do those things. But we don't do what we do in order to get the celebration. Specifically to earn the praise. So this parable is challenging. Because it tells us that if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, if we're going to be an apprentice of Jesus, then we have to learn to be a servant who serves for service sake. That that's what's important is the serving, doing what God calls us to do, doing what God has enabled us to do, created us to do. That's what's important. But there's another side to this, this parable that I also think is really important for us to hear. Because if you look at this parable a different way, then you see this parable can be a way of helping us understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, almost in reverse. Because this parable reminds us that, of the truth that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. We, we can't check the right number of boxes. We can't say the right things at the right time. We can't crack some kind of divine code. There is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. But here's the, the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. You see, God, while we could do nothing to earn our salvation, God did everything for our salvation. And while God owes us nothing, the reality is we owe God everything. Everything. There's a great story about a young man named James. He, was, he really had a plan for his life, and he wanted to start a business. He wanted to be known as a great salesman. And so he found an item that he liked and excited him, and, and he went out, and this was generations ago, he went out and he bought a buggy, and he bought a pony named Patty. And he was going to go out, make his product, sell his product, and make a fortune. That was his plan. Now, the item that he was excited about, the one that thrilled him to make, cheese. I don't know, maybe cheese excites you just as well, but it really excited him. And so James would make cheese, and when he had cheese made, he would load his buggy, he would hitch up Patty, they would take off through the streets of Chicago and go door to door selling cheese. But no one was really buying. And as the months passed, he was beginning to panic. Because James was realizing he didn't have very much money. He wasn't earning much. He didn't have enough really to, to buy food for himself. Barely enough to buy food for Patty. Not much enough, not really enough to make more cheese. And so at the end of a very long and disappointing day, he sat down to pour out his heart to his one and only friend in the world, Patty. And after sharing all that he was thinking all of his woes, his stress, he finally shared with Patty, maybe I need to get things in better order. Maybe I need to serve God and to place God first and then let the rest happen if it ever happens. And so he went to see his his pastor and his the church his family went to, and, and he told him that he wanted to help, he wanted to serve, he wanted to find his place working in the church as he was starting his new business. He wanted to learn how to put God first and, and let business come second. And over the years, he served his church in a lot of ways, almost every way they asked him along the way. But finally, he found himself as the coordinator of Sunday school. And he served in that role for the last 40 years of his life. 
He even decided along the way that he, when he made the commitment to, to serve God, put God first, he started giving 10% of his income to the church. He started tithing. And, and then he decided that was not enough. And so he's, by the end of his life, he was giving 25% of his income to his church to support its ministries. And whenever anyone asked him why he served the way he served at his church and, and why he gave the way he gave, he always replied, that God had already done so much for him. He was simply doing what he was called to do. So whenever you go out and enjoy any of the 200 plus products that the craft company produces today, you remember James L. Craft, who said as his personal motto, my first job is serving Jesus. We owe everything to God. And if we're honest, we, we know that's true. We should be grateful for everything we have. Even our life has been a gift to us from the hands of our Creator. We owe our life and everything in it to God. And so we should do the most with this gift we've been given, serve the most in all the ways that we can. Back during World War II, there was French soldiers who were captured by the Germans and they were put to work in a German's munitions factory. And the Germans thought it was amusing to have the French soldiers building bombs that they would then send to bomb France. And when the French soldiers figured this out through some means, they decided they couldn't, they couldn't do that. And so they created a malfunction in the device that would actually detonate the bomb. It was supposed to explode on impact, and, and because of what they did, many of the bombs did not go off when they hit. The French military saw so many unexploded bombs that they decided they had to investigate this, and, and they started getting the bombs and taking the bombs carefully apart, and, and inside the bombs they found slips of paper that said, we are doing the best we can with what we've got, where we are, every chance we get. While God owes us nothing, God has given us everything. And so we should do the most with what we've been given. We should do the best we can with what we got where we are, every chance we get to serve him. Not because of praise and accolades, but because that's what we're called to do. As I said, when we read this passage with today's mentality, it causes us to struggle. We all want trophies and power and prestige, at attention and accolades. We, we, we oftentimes think that we're entitled, that we are owed. But while no one owes us anything, God still gives us everything. And the way we respond is to be a servant. Putting God and others first in our life. So maybe this week, we look at the motives in our life. Do we do what we do for attention, for the praise? Or do we do what we do because we are all called to serve? Putting God first, loving our neighbors as ourselves, learning to be a servant to all, these are part of growing to be an apprentice of Jesus. And while we don't do it for the praise, I will give you some other good news. While we don't do this for the praise, while we don't follow Jesus for the praise, if we are faithful, then one day we will get to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And that will be the best of all.
because those words will come from the one who really matters. Amen.